never pick the easy road. Mm. Never. Never. And it always goes back to kind of the hero mentality. Never pick the easy road. Ever in your life. That is the one road that is doomed. It is doomed. If you want something like six minute abs, all mm-hmm. these different things, if you want it so fast, mm. you you may achieve what you wanted, but you want the permanent fix. The permanent fix comes from the hard road. The hard road gives you permanent results. Mm. The easy road gives you the quick fix. You will go back to where you started on the easy route. That hard route is so permanent that it ends up callousing you everywhere. Everywhere. You keep a six pack forever. You keep it. <laughs> you keep it. Because you know the work that goes yeah, into it. Yeah. I know how it feels to be approaching an energetic dead end. I've been there too many times to count. I understand the temptation to sell short, but I also know that impulse is driven by your mind's desire for comfort. And it's not telling you the truth. It's your identity trying to find sanctuary, not help you grow. It's looking for status quo, not reaching for greatness or seeking wholeness. But the software update that you need to shut your governor down is no supersonic download. It takes 20 years to gain 20 years of experience. And the only way to move beyond your 40% is to callous your mind day after day, which means you will have to chase pain like it's your damn job. Imagine you're a boxer and on your first day in the ring, you take one on your chin. It's going to hurt like in hell, but at year 10, being a boxer, you won't be stopped by one punch. You'll be able to absorb 12 rounds of getting beat the f- down and come back the very next day and fight again. It's not that the punch has lost power. Your opponent's will be even stronger. The change has happened within your brain. You've calloused your mind over a period of time. Your tolerance for mental and physical suffering will have expanded because your software will have learned that you can take a hell of a lot more than one punch. And if you stay with any task that is trying to beat you down, you will reap rewards. Not a fighter. Say you like to run but have a broken pinky toe. I'll bet if you continue running on it, pretty soon you'll be able to run on broken legs. Sounds impossible, right? I know it's true because I've run on broken legs and that knowledge helped me endure all manner of agonies on the ultra circuit, which has revealed a clear spring of self-confidence that I drink from whenever my tank is dry. Nobody taps their reserve 60% right away or all at once. The first step is to remember that your initial blast of pain and fatigue is your governor talking. Once you do that, you are in control of the dialogue in your mind and you can remind yourself that you are not as drained as you think, that you haven't given it your all, not even close. Buying into that will keep you in the fight and that's worth an extra 5%. Of course, that's easier read than done. It wasn't easy to begin the fourth lap of the Hurt 100 because I knew how much it would hurt. And when you are feeling dead and buried, dehydrated, wrung out, and torn the fuck up at 40%, finding that extra 60% feels impossible. I didn't want my suffering to continue. Nobody does. That's why the Lyme fatigue makes cowards of us all is true as Mind you, I didn't know anything about the 40 rule that day. The Hurt 100 is when I first started to contemplate it, but I had hit the wall many times before and I had learned to stay present and open-minded enough to recalibrate my goals even at my lowest. I knew that staying in the fight is always the hardest and most rewarding first step. Of course, it's easy to be open-minded when you leave yoga class and are taking a stroll by the beach, but when you're suffering, keeping an open mind is hard work. The same is true if you're facing a daunting challenge on the job or at school. Maybe you're tackling a hundred question tests and know that you've bricked the first 50. At that point, it's extremely difficult to maintain the necessary discipline to force yourself to keep taking the test seriously. It's also imperative that you find it because in every failure, there is something to be gained. Even if it's only practice for the next test you'll have to take because that next test is coming. That's a guarantee. It's not about suffering and how people may look at suffering. Like you have to dis go to a place that just every day of your life is suffering. 
You have to tap into suffering every day of your life because we have so much scarring that we have to clean up. You have to look at suffering as almost like I look at failure. To succeed, you must fail. In failure and in suffering, all the answers are in there. All the answers to all the test questions, the test is your life. All the answers are in there. You don't have to live in suffering and pain and failure all the time. You have to learn, I need to visit it. Like people hate working out. You're only going to visit working out maybe an hour a day. 23 other hours of the day, you're not in it. Mm. But how you become in shape is you must visit suffering, visit working out one hour a day. Visit suffering one hour a day. Visit your past failures one hour a day. The relationship with it is the answers are in there. They they are in there within the suffering. Go in there and I call it the live autopsy. The live autopsy. How you find out someone died, they crack you open after you're dead. How you can live is do it while you're alive. Mm. Go back in your brain, crack it open while you're alive. Don't wait until you're dead to figure out why you died. Do it while you are living. Go in there, go into the suffering, go into the pain of your life and say, why did this suck for me so bad? Why am I afraid of all this stuff? Why have I shut down the whole world? I guarantee I'll tell you why you shut down the whole world. It's in these nooks of the suffering within your brain, in the scarring, are all the answers to why you are on the couch feeling sorry for yourself. They lie within the scars. Visit them for at least an hour a day, study them, and then you'll find out more about yourself. You will then grow. So don't look at it every day I suffer. Go into it an hour a day. Learn from yourself, learn from life, learn from your failures, learn from your insecurities, learn from your self-doubt. Don't just say, I'm afraid to jump off an airplane. Mm. What makes you afraid of it? Study it. That's why I studied my mind. Why I became so powerful in the mind is because I realized I was weak. So instead of running away from the mind, I dove into it and said, what is making me weak? Oh, this makes sense. I came from hell. I came from a place that beat me down to nothing, which is why I'm afraid. All this makes sense. So systematically, one by one, I went back and met every single person in my mind, every situation. I went one-on-one with them again in my mind and said, okay, let's now revisit this. And that's how you do it. Mm-hmm. That's how it works. So I used to coach a lot of people. I don't coach anybody now. So what it was, my first question was, okay, what are you willing to give up? What are you willing to sacrifice? What are you willing to to forgo because a lot of people like this guy came in one time I was a, a trainer he goes man I can stop doing anything but my frappuccino I go fucking leave because I'm looking for that person like me people people. it's hard for people to understand how I lost 106 pounds in less than 3 months I sat down at the table and I said to myself what are you willing to give up everything And when people come to me with that kind of mindset, I can work with you. When you are willing to strip yourself down to nothing and give everything, that's who I want to work with. Because now I can mold you into exactly who you want to be. When you put these restrictions up, and that's that's what my first question is, how bad do you want this? If it's as bad as you want to live or breathe or sleep, whatever the hell it may be, I can work with you. But a lot of people, most people don't want it that badly. Which is why they always ask the question, man, how did you get to where you are? Do you know how to do it? You know exactly how to be you or how to be me. You don't want to do it. So I can't make you do it. And nor do I have the time or energy to force you into that place that I know you have to be to do it. There's no luck in this game. man. It may be a little bit of luck, but the luck happens after you bust your ass. And you put yourself in that lucky situation. Luck doesn't happen. You put yourself in that situation where luck might happen. And that's what people don't know. But to get there, luck ain't going to happen. You have to put yourself in that situation, man. It takes a lot of work. Our culture has become hooked on the quick fix, the life hack efficiency. 
everyone is on the hunt for that simple action algorithm that nets maximum profit with the least amount of effort. There's no denying this attitude may get you some of the trappings of success, if you're lucky, but it will not lead to a callous mind or self-mastery. If you want to master the mind and remove your governor, you'll have to become addicted to hard work because passion and obsession, even talent, are only useful tools if you have the work ethic to back them up. My work ethic is the single most important factor in all of my accomplishments. Everything else is secondary. And when it comes to hard work, whether in the gym or on the job, the 40 rule applies. To me, a 40 hour work week is a 40% effort. It may be satisfactory, but that's another word for mediocrity. Don't settle for a 40 hour work week. There are 168 hours in a week. That means you have the hours to put in that extra time at work without skimping on your exercise. It means streamlining your nutrition, spending quality time with your wife and kids. It means scheduling your life like you're on a 24 hour mission every single day. The number one excuse I hear from people as to why they don't work out as much as they want to is that they don't have time. Look, we all have work obligations. None of us want to lose sleep and you'll need time with the family or they'll trip the fuck out. I get it. And if that's your situation, you must win the morning. When I was full time with the SEALs, I maximized the dark hours before dawn. When my wife was sleeping, I would bang out a six to 10 mile run. My gear was all laid out the night before. My lunch was packed and my work clothes were in my locker at work where I shower before my day started at 7.30 a.m. On a typical day, I'd be out the door for my run just after 4 a.m. And back by 5.15 a.m., since that wasn't enough for me and because we only owned one car, I rode my bike. I finally got my own sh 25 miles to work. I'd work from 7.30 a.m. to noon and eat at my desk before or after my lunch break. During the lunch hour, I'd hit the gym or do a four to six mile beach run, work the afternoon shift and hop on my bike for the 25 mile ride home. By the time I was home at 7 p.m., I'd have run about 15 miles, rock 50 miles on the bike and put in a full day at the office. I was always home for dinner and in bed by 10 p.m. so I could do it all over again the next day. On Saturdays, I'd sleep in until 7 a.m. in a three hour workout and spend the rest of the weekend with Kate. If I didn't have a race, Sundays were my active recovery days. I'd do an easy ride at a low heart rate, keeping my pulse below 110 beats per minute to stimulate healthy blood flow. Maybe you think I'm a special case or an obsessive maniac. Fine, I won't argue with you. But what about my friend Mike? He's a big time financial advisor in New York City. His job is high pressure and his workday is a hell of a lot longer than eight hours. He has a wife and two kids, and he's an ultra runner. Here's how he does it. He wakes up at 4 a.m. Every weekday, he runs 60 to 90 minutes each morning while his family is still snoozing, rides a bike to work and back, and does a quick 30-minute treadmill run after he gets home. He goes out for longer runs on weekends, but he minimizes its impact on his family obligation. He's high-powered, wealthy as f and could easily maintain his status quo with less effort and enjoy the sweet fruits of his labors but he finds a way to stay hard because his labors are his sweetest fruits and he makes time to get it all in by minimizing the amount of bullshit clogging his schedule his priorities are clear and he remains dedicated to his priorities I'm not talking about general priorities here either each hour of his week is dedicated to a particular task. And when that hour shows up in real time, he focuses 100% on that task. That's how I do it too, because that is the only way to minimize wasted hours. Evaluate your life in its totality. We all waste so much time doing meaningless bull. We burn hours on social media and watching television, which by the end of the year would add up to entire days and weeks if you tabulated time like you do your taxes. You should, because if you knew the truth, you'd deactivate your Facebook account stat and cut your cable. 
When you find yourself having frivolous conversations or becoming ensnared in activities that don't better you in any way, 